Um, but I would like uh, now to uh, go to uh, Fiona Wieland. Um, and I think I didn't pronounce it completely right, but you will correct me, um, who is also an amazing colleague um, from uh, Dublin. And she's an artist, a writer, and a, lecture, a lecturer at the National College of Art and Design. And her art practice is committed to exploring and responding to systemic power relations, most specifically as they relate to class and gender inequalities. And she has, like uh, all the other speakers uh, today, a strong commitment to long-term cross-sectoral collaborations. Uh, Fiona, it's up to you now. Thank you, Jana. And uh, yeah, it's great. Um, thank you, Rick, also. Uh, it's great to listen. Um, yeah, hello to everybody. As Jana said, I'm an artist artist, a writer and an educator. Um, and as an artist, my practice is collaborative and for the last 17 years has been largely rooted in one part of Dublin called Rialto. Um, for those of you who know the city, it's, it's not too far from the Guinness Brewery. And I've worked there with the community organization called Rialto Youth Project. So in that time, we've developed a collaborative practice that really operates across sector and across discipline. And the projects I suppose we've worked on have engaged the staff of the organization, the young people there, their families and wider communities. And there's been kind of three major projects that have spanned that time frame. So typically they begin by bringing a group together in response to a, an open invitation. And then these processes build and accumulate over time. I suppose a core feature is that there's this sharing of lived experience that becomes quite central to the project and typically experience related to power and inequality. And then those experiences are unpacked and worked with and threaded together. And the processes slowly move from private to public over time, um, ultimately manifesting in, in visual, performative, dialogical events. Um, and I suppose the, the intention of those public moments really is that there's some form of interrogation of power. So, and then at the same time, I suppose, through collaboration, the intention is always that you're trying to grow power uh, collectively amongst a group of people. So I'll come back to the practice in a moment, but maybe just to, to delve into Jana's question, which she asked us in terms of how, how we came to art, how art became part of our DNA. I suppose for me, when I think back on it, art making was always there really in some way. I, I grew up in a home where my mother created an environment where making stuff and drawing at the kitchen table was about as natural as eating at it. So that, that sense of just making, as, as Rick says, just it's in every child, it felt very natural. And my parents weren't from a privileged background and they, they were of that generation that kind of worked hard to give their children some choices that they didn't have. So I did attend a secondary school where, where art was valued and, and artistic students were encouraged on a path to third level Interestingly, I suppose in that context, being artistic was, was equated with a kind of set of technical skills, like the kid who was good at drawing or painting, rather than a, a wider creativity. But I went, I went to art college straight from school and explored and tested and played, but there was a critical juncture, juncture where I found myself a little disillusioned by the singular journey I was on towards a kind of a life of a, a studio-based painter. And I was lucky at that time to have had a tutor who opened up the world of community-based practice to me. And then later, I, there really was a whole series of postgraduate programs emerging in tandem with my desire for them. And I know really to position myself, I suppose I do come from a generation that were the first to, to avail of a kind of a formal education within the field of social engaged practice. And that's not without issue, of course, but just, I suppose it positions me somewhere in terms of a, the cycle of the field maybe. But really, I suppose important in my story is the, my arrival in Rialto in 2004 as a visual artist. And I was really interested in collaborating with young people. I had done some teaching, but found myself often in these very hierarchical relationships um, that didn't really have the kind of reciprocity that I was interested in. So the idea of being an artist while present to young people in their local context was really exciting to me. And so it started as a formal residency in Studio 468 in Rialto. And then it built from there into an extended long-term relationship between myself and Rialto Youth Project. So just to, to give you a really brief context, Rialto has a strong network of community development groups, and many of which were established in the 80s and 90s. And in the 90s, Rialto was designated as disadvantaged by the state, but importantly, Rialto Youth Project really um, kind of refused to endorse this 
kind of depoliticized register in, in terms of the framing of disadvantage. And instead they would adopt the, the language, the more defiant language of oppression and marginalization with regards to the working class communities. And they're, they're quite a distinct organization in youth work in Ireland and they're really deeply rooted in the local context. And they'd already built quite a strong capacity for arts-based practice. So I suppose what I arrived into was that ecology that, that was there. And as an artist at that time in my twenties on my first ever residency, my appetite to immerse myself in a local context was really was really met by Jim Lawler, the manager um, of the organization up until quite recently, his willingness to create the conditions for me to coexist there as an artist over time working alongside a series, a, a team of youth workers. Um, so it was a real phase of learning and unlearning. And I suppose many of the skills and values that I would consider now as kind of the DNA of my art practice really emerged from that um, the immersion and exposure to, to community youth work. So like building long-term relationships and having those uncomfortable conversations, you know, the messy spaces where we're all working with difference and open-ended processes and all the deep listening and all of that, that, that now is the DNA of the work. I feel privileged that it really did emerge from a community youth work context. So I suppose what I've been doing in the last decade or so of my practice with Royal Youth Project is deploying the theme of power as a lens to, to look at the world, really to engage with the world for myself and, and those that were, were working together. And my insights today come from three collaborative projects, which can really, I suppose, be seen like chapters in a durational practice. They're all quite distinct in their own way, but then taken collectively, I think they offer a, a, a creative approach to engaging young people and adults over time in a critical examination of power, power relations. So I suppose the question of why power um, might be an obvious one, but I suppose my commitment in keeping power as the kind of core theme comes from that anger at the, the, the dominant narrative that naturalizes or depoliticizes inequality, you know, that makes it sound like people are where they are because they failed in some way rather than as a result of a, a systemic inequality. So. You know, we all know the kind of the history of social exclusion of so many people based on gender, race, class, sexuality, ethnicity. And then the remedy that's prescribed is one of social inclusion, which might sound OK, but it doesn't always take into account what someone's being included into and how willing that structure is to change once they're included. So I suppose in response to that paradigm, I'm proposing and attempting to really make the theme of power the focus of the work as an alternative ethical framework. Sometimes that means talking about power quite explicitly and then sometimes it means sort of arriving at conversations of power but through, through, through coming at it from other angles. But I suppose paying attention to power has become the kind of the DNA of the work really if I was to single it down. So I'm going to just share three moments visuals from practice um, to illustrate the approach to engaging power as a theme. I have written quite a lot about it um, including a, a memoir which covered the first 10 years of the collaboration. But today I'm just cutting straight into three distinct moments really that are part of a much longer process. Um, so Naomi, you might share my first image if you wouldn't mind. No, just reduce my screen, sorry, one moment. Thank you. So, the first moment here is taken from a four year project led by a collective made of two youth workers, nine young people and myself, an artist, who set out on this process in 2007 to explore the theme of power quite explicitly as our focus. We were always talking about power and, and the aim of the collective, well one aim came to be, could we be a horizontal collective with no hierarchy? And obviously that required us really exploring, was this even possible because of our own power relationships that framed us as a collective? So quite early in the process, we created this visual of a triangle to represent the different positions of the collective, you know, the artist, the youth worker and the young people. And I suppose visualizing our difference was so important while also intending to try to work in an equal way. And I was particularly concerned that we wouldn't neutralize the power relations, you know, just because we were striving to be equal didn't mean that we were. And so reminding ourselves and visualizing those power relations and then engaging in dialogue from that position to see where we could move to seemed, seemed an important thing to do. But while we were looking at our own power relations, 
Um, in terms of the practice, we're also exploring our lived experience of power and powerlessness. Sorry which involved this careful process of st sharing stories, which is a real feature of the work, anonymizing and working with those stories as a collective and journeying with, with them over years. And so from the exploration of power with this particular group, the theme of policing emerged and a whole series of works followed over the few years led by our collective where individual accounts of policing were worked with. But then we really started to put, try to put the triangle to work. So as a way to keep, to keep uh, visible, I suppose, the, this um, I suppose a, quite a highly antagonistic set of relationships really between kind of the, the, well, related to the policing of youth in a working class urban context. So what's happening here in this image um, is a group of police officers are reading aloud the accounts of young people's experiences of policing to the collective and, and a group of invited witnesses. And there is a, I mean, there's a visualization of power relations here in the triangle in the police and you can see the the hats and the batons were placed outside of the dialogical space as a kind of a symbol but then there's a subversion of power um as the the police read aloud the young people's stories as kind of a speaking truth to power moment but but for me that piece of floor that airspace in the middle of the triangle becomes this really particular space of listening and not just listening with kind of empathy but a kind of a political listening where people can kind of come to recognize that we coexist in this contingent set of power relations. Um, so if we could have the second image, please. The, so the subsequent, the subsequent project was called Natural History of Hope. I was led by a group of women staff from Rialto U Project and myself, and we engaged generations of women and girls living and working in Rialto to explore contemporary experiences of inequality, another four year project. And we took the methodology that we developed related to the gathering of testimonies and collectivizing them, collecting the wise them here into a script with lots of contrasting viewpoints. And I suppose the task then, as with previous project, is about moving the material and ourselves as a group slowly from private to public in this phased way, building over time. But this project evolved the engagement with the theme of power in a kind of particular way in that while policing was a very visible form of power that emerged in the young people's stories in the previous project, here in Natural History of Hope, we really began to look at more invisible forms of power, experienced as social norms that were revealed in the, the kind of intersection of class and gender inequality. So we had a whole series of events, so many of them for women publics, and then the project climaxed in a performance in collaboration with Broken Talkers Theatre Company, which saw 30 women guide a mannequin called Hope to survive and if possible thrive against a backdrop of, of complex social themes. So spoken narratives were accompanied on stage by a series of metaphors, again trying to give visual form to the often invisible power relations that shape life. And the performance again is an act of speaking truth to power where publics are invited to listen. So here, this moment uh, on stage where you see the, the balloon and um, the central character, Hope, who's a mannequin, is being introduced to the theme of class by one of the women, you know, class presented through the metaphor of the bubble, which emerged in one of the stories. The woman says, can you see it, Hope? Can you see the bubble? We're inside it. You see everything and everyone through that bubble and everyone sees the bubble when they look at you. They look at you in that bubble, they stare at you and they make decisions about you. And it, it continues on from there. Another metaphor was the shadow that followed hope everywhere, speaking to a threat of male violence that was identified in many of the gathered testimonies. I suppose drawing from the, the personal stories, actually uh, we, we really began to produce a visual lexicon for power in this, in this young woman's life from the stories that were gathered from women and girls living and working in Rialto. So, as Hope faces this untimely death that towards the end of the performance, there's a collective decision to rip the script uh, in defiance of this narrative for the character. And I suppose it's also intended as an act to unsettle the public from any kind of overly maybe sentimental or empathic response, because we're all implicated in the class and gender ecosystem that was being presented and now ripped. So I suppose for me, it's like these, these acts, these moments that I've highlighted become, they're kind of like a proposition, like, an action that's of course more easily achieved by 30 women in a performance than in anyone's real life against an array of oppressive forces. But the combination of lived experience, the visual symbols of power, and then this performative moment by a 
powerful group of women whose physical presence becomes part of how you experience that material. For me, there's something in those moments that just harbors some kind of potential for change. And then the third, the third image, just briefly, is um, from a current project called Natural History, or sorry, called What Does He Need? which is a collaboration between Reality Project myself and Broken Talkers Theatre Company. And it's a cross city project now established in 2018. And we're building on the previous methodology and we're attempting an increase in scale for this project, which is a question I, I probably have for others, touches on what Jana was just saying there. But we've developed various approaches to working with adults and young people and children in this project. And the core method sees groups come together to create a boy and collectively explore how that boy is shaped by the world he lives in and how he in turn shapes it. And in each, in each case, the boy character is always from the same place as the group. So which really positions the boy's life in a specific context, but also harnesses the local knowledge. And there's something uh, like I feel that each birth, each boy is born, something kind of new and unpredictable is set in motion. And symbolically, that feels like a kind of a potential for a rethinking of what's possible. Of course, the the boy is fictional but the process that the groups engage in represents some kind of collective effort to find agency for their boy against a range of particular like particular power relations so this staging of a fictional life into a real world just feels like there's some potential for conversations to move between the reality and the imaginary and then obviously invoke kind of political imaginary so it's early days for this project. It's, it's unfolding in a number of exciting ways at the moment. I know Danielle McKenna, who's the, the current team leader for L2 project, is here in the room. Um, but we, we have a, a program of philosophy sessions for male community workers. We're developing an audio walk and a poster project. And we have a vision for a summer school this summer in which those boy characters will, will play a central role. So it's very much live and unfolding. So perhaps just to end, I can, I can just share a current conversation that I'm having at the moment with the, the Royalty U project leadership. Um, I suppose we feel like we've developed some form of a rigorous project and each, each project builds on the previous. But after 17 years collaboration, I suppose there is this question around the formalizing of some of those values and methodologies and whether it's the moment to, to stop continuously having projects and turn it into some kind of a, an organization, an institution of sorts, potentially a school some form of radical school for young people, like a, a school of power for want of a better um, working title, but um, where we could really bring some of those um, methods, values, approaches from, from some of those projects together. And I suppose in doing so, we might be at risk of losing some of the open-ended values of project work, but then maybe on the flip side, there's some potential in the institutionalizing or institutionalizing being a dangerous word, but in formalizing in some way of the more radical form of social education. So I suppose that's that's a current dilemma and speaks a little bit to to some of the other panelists who who have taken that step into a slightly different space. So thank you. I hope I didn't go too over time. Thank you so much, Fiona. I know you're perfectly in time um, and I think what is sort of interesting um, in the way that you've been addressing power uh, as uh, uh, as talking about being part of this uh, collaborative space is how are we trying to create equal playing fields for everybody involved I think this is this is something that's a very important question I think something Rick also alluded to and I think uh, what came up which also been a very strong strand within Home Baked over uh, the years is storytelling or finding ways to have other voices tell stories about how they feel or not feel they have agency uh, in given situations about how their daily environment is formed, shaped, and governed, and I think this is something that uh, that 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 is also important to 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 that you brought to the table. That uh, this is like this how to create collective agency, and I think uh, Amara, who's next, will probably talk a little bit more about that. So I think that's a very good lead into, and I think what is also interesting, which is coming. Um, to the table now is like, when is it time to leave? Um, also a good question. So although the art as DNA of a process will never uh, probably leave, but when uh, do some people leave? Uh, I think this is also important.